everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and I'm here with Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. So weird recording of doing this live stream on a non-Monday. I'm all out. I'm all cattywampus. It's going to really throw you off. It is. I'm really going to have to listen to those soothing Dave Matthews albums after this. Oh, you know how it is. (laughs) I'm very excited about this. This has been, uh, there was risk that I wasn't even going to be here. Uh, with so many scheduling updates. It just shows you, just keep rescheduling. Eventually, the planets will align. And here we are. Uh, one of our very, very, very favorite guests is back to talk to us about ADHD misdiagnoses, inattentive misdiagnoses, I should say. Before we do that, we're going to head over to Take Control ADHD so you can get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to our mailing list, and we will send you an email each time a new episode is released. And, of course, if this show has ever touched you in any way, shape, or form, preferably the good kind, uh, we would love to invite you to visit patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. This is listener-supported podcasting. For a few bucks a month, you can help us grow the show, focus our attention on the show, most importantly, and you get access to some great perks like the online community, like early access to the show, like actually watching us live stream. I know you're sitting there, you're praying, your fingers are crossed for those hot mic moments where Nikki and Pete screw up. Uh, but we, we try to avoid those, but happens. my goodness, it happens. <laughs> uh, so anyway, thank you so much for those who are already uh, dedicated supporters. We so appreciate you. And for those who are just considering, thank you very much. Patreon.com slash D-A-D-H-D podcast. We have some announcements. Yes, very brief. Very brief. Study halls. We are still doing study halls on Thursday afternoons. So we have a few weeks left. If you're interested in getting some work done and working with a great group of people online, we are body doubles for each other and we do the Pomodoro method. And so uh, check out my website for under study halls, right? You'll put that in oh, the show sure, notes, I'm yes. Of course. Uh, and sign up for that. And then I also want to make an announcement again about the ADHD International Conference, which is online this year. And it is from November 5th through the 7th. And we will have a link to sign up for that as well. Great opportunity to listen to some great keynotes, great speakers. Pete. Joyous, wink, joyous wink. speakers, you might say. <laughs> Joyous speakers. That's right. Uh, and uh, since you don't have to travel and you've never, if you've never been to a conference, this would be a great opportunity to check it out and see there what you it's go. like. Links in the show notes. Thanks. Dr. Michelle Frank is back with us today, y'all. Michelle Frank is a clinical psychologist specializing in providing diagnostic and treatment services to individuals with ADHD. Uh, Her work with clients is all about finding strengths-based approaches to learn how to live with ADHD. She co-authored a fantastic book with Sari Soldan, A Radical Guide for Women with ADHD, Embrace Neurodiversity, Live Boldly, Boldly, and Break Through Barriers. And she's a regular around these parts. We so appreciate her joining us again today. Michelle, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here again. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being uh, yes, here. thank you for being here. So this, I, I, Nikki, you need to kick this off. This was this was your brainstorm. This was yes. So uh, we're going to be talking today about ADHD, inattentive ADHD, and uh, I want listeners to get a better understanding of what it is and how it can be misdiagnosed uh, and why it gets missed. And so this uh, this situation, this type of ADHD, is. Uh, often more missed with girls and women. However, it does affect all genders. So I definitely want people to um, understand that and be listening to what Michelle and I have to talk about because this could be a family member. This could be you if you're not sure if you have ADHD or not, or if you're thinking that one of your kids does or whatever. Um, It's a very easy diagnosis to get missed. And uh, one of the things I want to share first off before we get to to Michelle's experience and and ideas and thoughts is I want to share my own experience with my daughter that I had. Um, and uh, it's funny when we start talking about really personal things, my heart like starts to race a little bit. So <laughs> I, 
I hope that this comes out okay. Um, As we know, I'm an ADHD coach. And so my whole life is around ADHD. I do a lot of talking about it. And I have talked a lot about it to my family. And a couple of years ago, late summer, my daughter came downstairs and says, Mom, I think I have ADHD. And I'm like, really? Why? Like, where did this come up? Now, I will be honest. I have had ideas, thoughts that maybe this might be the case just from some certain, you know, things that she was doing, but not enough to actually say, I think you need to get tested, right? But she actually came down, said, I was working on a homework assignment with a friend of mine. And what took her 20 minutes to do, I know would have taken me at least two hours to do. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. And of course, the coach and me, red flag, that's that's interesting. And uh, so we ended up taking this test together online. She took it, I took it. And it showed that there was a very high possibility that, that she might have ADHD. And uh, it does run in our family on my on her father's side. Um, she has several cousins and, and some uncles that have ADHD. Um, and there were little things that I noticed uh, that was happening, not just the assignment, because I wouldn't have known that, right? Unless she had actually said to me it was taking her longer. Um, but her organization, she showed me her binder um, that she was using for homework. And you know how like a typical binder might have like some categories like through through you, you're going to have like a... Um, yeah, you're like subjects. You're like subject binder, right? Yeah, yeah sure. you have a subject and then you pull the tab yeah. and you have another subject. Well, the way she was organizing, she was putting everything all just in the binder. Like however it came to her, she yeah, put by, it in by, there. So there were by no date. categories. Organizing by date. <laughs> yeah. Less effective. <laughs> it's very but, chronological. Yeah, it's okay. It's a strategy. <laughs> yeah, it's a strategy. And uh, she would do homework, but then she would forget to turn in the completed assignments. Um, in her, I think it was seventh grade, we did a uh, a teacher evaluate or not a teacher evaluation, but a conference, right? And the teachers would say, you know, she does, she's so great in class. She's paying attention. She's listening. She's, uh, you know, she does everything that she needs to do. But there are times where she sometimes forgets to turn in her homework or she'll forget to like put her name on there or something like that. And uh, so these were all things in my mind, knowing ADD, knowing ADHD as well as I know it, I started getting these red flags. So I said, okay, let's go to the doctor. And we went to her um, primary uh, physician. And the doctor gave us a couple of questionnaires to give to her teachers. Well, this was right before her eighth grade year. So her eighth grade teachers didn't really know her very well. So we went ahead and gave it to the seventh grade teachers to fill out. And of course, they all filled it out as, you know, she's great. And none of these symptoms came out to them. Her evaluation from the the teacher compared to like how I filled it out were completely night and day. I mean, you would think that we were talking about a different kid altogether. So when we went back and talked to the doctor about this, I told the doctor, I said, I know this is what's happening. This is what you see at school, but I really think that there's something else going on. And the doctor said, well, I think you're too close to ADHD um, because of what I do. And that she sees it more as a like depression, anxiety issue. Well, I knew my daughter had anxiety. I mean, that wasn't a surprise, but I'm like, no, but there's still more to to this. And uh, so she's like, no, I, I think it's more anxiety. Well, I wasn't going to let that go. So I was like, okay, whatever. Um, so I went and I looked for a psychiatrist who diagnoses ADHD. And I'll be honest, it took a while for me to find one who was open to seeing her that wasn't like a year waiting list. I mean, it is hard. It is hard to to find somebody to do this. But I found somebody and wasn't covered under my insurance. But I said, I don't care. I will pay however much it costs because I want her to be properly evaluated. And uh, so he um, he got her in probably about a month, a month and a half, which was the shortest list that I could find. And sure enough, after doing um, a whole day of testing, which you know has to do with a lot of different avenues and different evaluations that we had to to um, fill out, he came um, back saying that, yes, she has an attentive um, ADHD with some depression and anxiety, 
And you need to watch out for those things just as much as the ADHD. And, uh, you know, it, it was one of those things that I went to a conference, ADHD conference, which is fabulous. And I, I purposely at this conference took courses that had to do with girls and ADHD and, uh, and, and why this was so common to be misdiagnosed. Um, so I want to bring in Dr. Michelle Frank because I know that if I didn't have the expertise that I have, she would have been missed. There's no doubt in my mind that somebody would have just taken the word of the doctor and just say, okay, this is what she has. And she would have, you know, com- continued to struggle. So I guess a good place for us to start, uh, Michelle, is what is inattentive ADHD? Can, what's the difference here? Why is it so hard to, to not see? So there are a few different questions in that. All right. I know. <laughs> I'm not supposed to stack them, but I do anyway. <laughs> I know. I do. I do too. Um, so let's, okay. So let's start with what inattentive is, right? So ADHD is, um, it's, it's not described this way in the DSM, but it really is a, a spectrum condition, right? It's a chronic condition. And, um, there's a lot of like uh, variability with even within the diagnosis. And in trying to deal with that over the years, the folks studying the diagnosis and making all the manuals have had a whole lot of fun with naming this condition. I mean, Right. So a lot of people think inattentive type is the same as ADD. And, you know, if it's if you're hyperactive, then you have ADHD. But if so, the name has changed a lot over the years. And right now, what it is is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So that's the global condition. And then you specify, and there are three specifiers. Uh, One is predominantly hyperactive impulsive type, the other is predominantly inattentive presentation. It's presentation, not type anymore. Um, and the third is combined presentation. Um, and basically, it, the predominantly inattentive presentation um, has and, and combined or hyperactive. I mean, they, they all ha- struggle with executive functioning uh, skills in, in similar ways. They all struggle with regulation. What's unique about predominantly inattentive is that they do not present with the hyperactivity, the restlessness, and oftentimes they don't present with impulsivity either. Um, there can be more of like a, a processing lag sometimes for inattentive folks. Memory uh, stuff is and organizational stuff is very front and forward for them. And then obviously, as the the name says, the inattention distractibility piece is their primary challenge. Whereas you 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 look at someone with a combined or hyperactive type, they're going to have, um, you know, the distractibility and inattention, but you, they're also going to describe some pretty forward-facing challenges with the impulsivity and hyperactivity. Where this gets extra tricky is that (laughs) what we're doing is we're breaking the diagnosis down based on the presence of externalizing symptoms (laughs) versus internal experience. This is why ADHD is so hard to measure. That's a different podcast. But there are a few things that I think, I don't don't know, it went Mm -hmm. wrong really here with the initial assessment for your daughter, right? The first is this continued um, gender bias and this assumption of presentation of psychiatric condition based on gender presentation. So the, you know, most people, what they know about ADHD is still white hyperactive school age boys who are struggling behaviorally and in school. Uh, The second is her performance is tied to academics. There's another problem we have there, right? That if you have ADHD, it will show in school. Well, not always. Um, Especially these inattentive kids who aren't displaying the externalizing hyperactive behaviors. It's a felt sense of struggle. And they will go home and they will work for hours to try to make up for it. And um, no one will really, quote, see it in the same way. Um, You know, and, and then there's this idea that 
depression, anxiety, and ADHD, that all of these things are standalone categories and don't have anything to do with each other as opposed to the intersections of, um, you know, mental health challenges, the ways that maybe some of these other challenges lead to anxiety, uh, not just the other way around. We're used to looking at anxiety causes decreased concentration. It's like this very linear um, flow chart, and that's really not how it works in real time. So the ADHD going undiagnosed, I mean, I know she's young, so but not being discovered could have easily caused the anxiety because she was working so hard to do what somebody else was doing in 20 minutes or whatever. It it definitely can. I think too with ADHD, the, the, like the bouncing around of Mm -hmm. thoughts, right. The difficulties turning the, the the default mode network that like, you know, the ESPN ticker Mm -hmm. at the bottom of the screen that's going in your head all the time. The ADHDers do not, like the natural mechanism to turn that off doesn't always Mm -hmm. work. So there is this like the difficulty tuning out even your internal experience, Mm -hmm. right? We're talking about distractibility. We're not just talking, we are definitely talking about external stimuli, but not alone. We're also talking about difficulty tuning out internal stimuli. This is where you see some people uh, with ADHD have some sensory issues. They cannot ignore the tag on their shirt. Um, And so it, you know, the tuning out kind of goes both ways because it's a really focusing of mm-hmm. of the mind. So um, in that, I think a lot of ADHDers, because of the default mode network problem, can have a lot of repetitive thought loops, a lot of worry. ADHDers also have some dysregulation of the amygdala, right? hyperactive uh, emotion mm-hmm. mind. So it all mm-hmm. plays together. And I don't think we do ourselves a very good service by trying too hard to say this is where one thing begins and this is where the other ends and you fit into this box, not that box. I, I just don't, I, you know, human beings are fluid. We need to treat them as such. Say that I wasn't an ADHD coach and and somebody that's listening to this, well, take me out of it. Just say that somebody that's listening to this is wondering if their child may have a, inattentive ADHD. What would be some good questions to ask as a parent to a child, because you're, you're talking about, it's more about how you feel, not the external factor. So what would be some good questions to actually get at maybe how they feel? Mm-hmm. The external is there if you know right. what to look for. Things like forgetting the lunchbox over and over, right? Um, really asking questions. Um, what hap- Tell me what it's like when you read a book. Mm-hmm. You know, what happens when we're watching a movie? What happens when you're sitting in class? What's that like for you? Um, Tell me about what it's like to do your homework. Tell me what it's like when you're playing with. Really get in, get a get a curious, mm-hmm. you know, inquisitive frame of mind going to ask about what their lived experiences when they're doing certain things. Uh, we just assume everybody f- is, you know, does homework the same, uh, or it, you know, should or shouldn't be in a certain state. So, I think being curious about what their experience is like in those moments, but you want to be looking for things like. Um, daydreaming you want to be looking at things like um do you have a hard time you know tuning out things happening around you sights or smells or sounds which is worse which is better um is it easier you know to be in a quiet space or in a loud Mm -hmm. space people with adhd will answer that question differently right because it's all about adjusting the stimulation to meet you where you are you're at um you know asking about memory um you know, how often are you losing your phone and your homework and your book and your mm-hmm. keys? And when they get older, looking at inattentive driving patterns, mm-hmm. that's huge. Fender benders, um, inattentive accidents, you know, bumping into mailboxes, um, mm-hmm. things like that. Uh, the inattentive, you know, versus like the impulsives, you'll, they'll get a lot of speeding mm-hmm. tickets. So it's these peace raising oh, hands. This whole thing. conversation makes me so mad, you guys. Ah. Oh. <laughs> For crying out loud. I had both. Yeah, I'm combined and I I, I bumped into <laughs> poles and got speed tickets. So yeah, we're what we have one for everything. But it, so it's it's looking at the nuances of daily life. You're not always gonna be able to get at it um you know, unilaterally with one line of questioning. It, it you know, I, I we're talking about this first in the context of you know our our kids, but 
I am suddenly, as you're sort of assessing what to look for in the external presentation, I, I've never asked that myself. What was, like, I was 28 when I was diagnosed and by our marriage therapist. And the, he was the one who said, you know, you, your marriage is fine. Pete, let's talk about your ADHD. First time I've ever heard about that, right? That was total news to me. And I'd seen him only for three or four weeks. And he picked that up and answered so many questions in that one line that I'd had all my life because I am, I'm inattentive. And as such, I got speeding tickets. I got lost my license. And I would do this impulsive thing where I would just go driving and I would drive to places I've never been before. And I'd get horrifically lost without having a map in the car because I wasn't thinking that far ahead. Like that happened more than once. Uh, you know, all of those questions that God, I wish I'd had answered in school. But I, they, you know, they had, there, there was no sense that anybody was looking for me when I was in middle school. There was no, like, there was one kid who had, it was living with ADHD and was super, like, pegged on hyperactive. And so he was like a showcase of what everybody thought ADHD was. And here I was dealing with this for years completely ignored. And to the point when I said, when I was 28, I had my diagnosis, I called my mother and I said, hey, <laughs> look what I got. And there was, she was flabbergasted. No, didn't believe it. I think it's hard for, for guys with, in a sense of presentation, because it's like, well, I don't even, you know, I can't do ADHD mm -hmm. right. I'm, you know, it's supposed to be this way, you know, and there's supposed to be the split along gender lines, which is, you know, while gen the, the discussions of, of gender related issues are important, we, we do have to move away when we're trying to like, you know, work in the diagnostic lane in mm -hmm. some ways, mm -hmm. because, you know, it, it, I've had hyperactive impulsive, you know, uh, clients who identify as women. I've had an instance of clients who identify as men mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, everything in between it, it, yeah. But there yeah. are these stereotypes of what mm -hmm. it looks like. Mm -hmm. I had one of the things uh, that my daughter told me was that she she could easily sit in class and just nod her head. And and, you know, she's like, I have no idea what the teacher's saying, but exactly. I sure look good. I sure look like I'm paying attention. Uh, so I think that's I mean, mm -hmm. definitely, again, one of the symptoms of, of trying to kind of figure out where their head is, what's happening in the, these situations. Well, and I, and I think, too, back to your question of how this how a misdiagnosis or an, or an ignored diagnosis or, or a missed or misdiagnosis um, the the whole act of then let's say years later peeling back and figuring out that this isn't just anxiety or depression that there are some underlying contexts here that that's the question rolling back in my mind like for for our listeners who are living with this or have had later in life diagnoses like at what is it that we're looking for to assess that fe that lived experience that tells you wait a minute there might be some other things i can i can look for uh, you know, that might be related to ADHD and not anxiety, as my doctors have been telling me all this time, as they've been maybe medicating me for whatever. Like, how do you how do you start to peel that apart? What do you look for in yourself? That's hard. Um, it goes back to this idea that people aren't one thing. Yeah. Um, and it points to the complexity of the mental health diagnostic system and the spectrum of neurodiversity that we're all on. What I will say is typically uh, people who have um, co-occurring conditions and, you know, I've, it, depending on the study you're looking at, you know, 60, 70 or more percent of people with ADHD have co-occurring conditions, psychiatric conditions, yeah. uh, which makes it even more confusing. But oh, a pretty good tell is like you've done everything to treat the anxiety. You've done you've done the therapy, you've done the meds, the anxiety has gotten pretty a lot better. You know, maybe not all the way gone, but like, you know, nobody should have anxiety all the way gone, right. by the way, right? Like yeah, it's, right. It's, it is an evolutionary uh, yeah, yeah. Right. benefit. Because of tigers. Uh, but, right. Um, but, you know, it's gotten a lot better, but I'm still spinning my wheels, feel like I'm, you know, treading water, you know, every day uh, because I can't keep up with my life because of the organization, because of the time management, because I tune out in meetings and forget to worry in class and I forget the really important thing. And I, you know, 
do the paper and don't hand it in. And I forget about, you know, I have all these parking tickets. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the rest of your life still is not coming together. Well, that doesn't really look like, you know, anxiety anymore than does it. Then now we're talking this ex the executive functioning and, and self-regulation piece, uh, which is different. The one there, there are some overlaps you know, with anxiety. Um, we do see it, trouble with concentration. We see some real repetitive thought loops and ADHD folks can get stuck in a lot of thought loops and certainly decreased concentration is a huge part of it. The thing is those symptoms for ADHD tend to persist outside of an anxiety episode, outside of an anxiety trigger, and once uh, even a more generalized anxiety disorder is treated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might get a partial treatment of something, but the rest of this is still falling apart. And the other place to look is the domains of your life. ADHD is one psychiatric diagnosis that impacts every domain of functioning and actually as a result has some of the unfortunate unfortunately, uh, poorest life and health outcomes if it's not treated appropriately. Mm -hmm. And it impacts every domain of your mm -hmm. functioning. So it's very pervasive. And usually there's a pattern of that pervasiveness looking back where, you know, my anxiety and depression, they were really good then, but like uh, these other, these other pieces of my life are really falling mm -hmm. apart. One of the things that, uh, I learned at the conference a couple of years ago is that if you start noticing grades change or, or things starting to change in middle school, like they were saying around middle school, what is it? Is it because they're going through puberty at that point or hormones or what is it about that age group? That is definitely part of everything wrong yes. with middle school, right? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but the the other piece is a change in structure. Usually then you're getting lockers for walking from class to class. You no longer have one teacher. Some schools start that a little earlier, but the bigger jump tends to be sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Uh, so it's usually like, if you look at like fourth grade, there's a pretty big jump from first, second, and third, you know, and then like sixth, seventh, like in, eight, in there, there's another big jump. And then high school, there's another big jump. College, there's another big jump. So there tend to be these markers of where uh, you need more self-organization. You need more self-directed behavior. You need more of these executive functioning skills, more self-regulation. And the support drops off a notch. And then it drops off another notch and another notch. And then that's why I get a lot of young adults in my office, right? Because then the supports drop fully off, but they've been quote, good enough students all these years. They maybe not as, uh, you know, maybe they didn't end up uh, they, looking back. They wish some things had been different, but they did. Okay. They did. Okay. And then all of a sudden living on their own life responsibilities mm -hmm. creep up and boom. Are the symptoms different right? in adults than they would be that you would see in a, in a teenager or tween? When it comes to inattentive, okay. no, largely the descriptions are much the same. I mean, I ask people, you know, so tell me like, what, what is, what is ADHD like for you now? What does it mean for you now? What's your journey been? Well, what was it like for you as a kid? And they often say, you know, um, I think it was kind of the same. Like I've learned some different uh, coping mechanisms and strategies. I have some tools now to deal with it, but it still looks the same. I think the for, for inattentive presentation, the context is what changes more than, and, and, and the treatment or lack thereof, you know, those things can change. The presentation itself is pretty similar. The one thing with ADHD overall that does seem to sh make the biggest shift into adulthood is that the hyperactivity goes underground. Hyperactivity becomes less visibly apparent and hyperactive folks will tell you that, you know, they might have be bouncing their leg under their desk all day or needing to like, you know, need dough between their, their, you know, in their hands and meetings under the desk to keep the kinesthetic, uh, input coming, but they, uh, and they feel restless inside, but it's not something that you can always see on the outside. The other thing that does make a shift as we age and our brains mature is the impulsivity. I think it's a little bit better. And our executive functioning skills, they do, they do keep developing into adulthood. So you can see some improvement naturally in ADHD, you know, into like the late twenties. Um, that being said, some things may for some folks mm -hmm. always lag. I've had a couple of clients who have come to me without a, um, a formal diagnosis of ADHD, but they think they have it or they, they 
you know, identify with a lot of the symptoms. How important is it for someone like that to, to get a diagnosis? Or is it, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. I mean, yeah, it's, it all gets very right. philosophical. Um, uh, I would say it depends. I would say it depends on what that person is needing mm-hmm. and looking for. How how strong, um, you know, how strongly do they rate their distress and impairment? Um, are they just looking for tools? And it's sort of like, regardless of if I have the diagnostic diagnosis or not i mean i still want these tools and these you know i want to step take things up a notch or is it that their life is really falling apart and they're deeply distressed uh there are a lot of things that that you know can be misdiagnosed uh when it comes to adhd trauma is a big one um and so we we don't want to be overlooking some of the treatment needs right so if you're someone for instance with trauma you might need a a bit of a different treatment plan than someone without. If you're someone who is pretty high functioning in life and doesn't really like feel the need to talk with a provider about a treatment plan though, and you're just looking for like, uh, you know, you're, for instance, the accountability buddy sessions you do, I mean, <laughs> should someone need a diagnosis to go to? No, absolutely not. Right. Um, so I, th- I think it's a matter of degree and it's so individual. No. Right. But that's what mental health diagnoses yeah. really come down to: are distress and mm-hmm. impairment, mm-hmm. and 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 stable uh, and low level of functioning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got stuck a little while ago, uh, which is this whole idea of you know your executive functioning keep it keeps developing, and and I guess the way I see that manifest that like I have I, I have a certain number of of organizational skills that I developed kind of in late college early career that kind of matured there. And as we're having this conversation, I realize I've been coasting on some of those skills, like some of those muscles. And that's why I get that. I I have that sort of constant feeling of peril that if I drop one thing, then the whole house of cards comes tumbling down, right? If that one appointment misses my calendar, then everything else will, will fall apart. And, and so, uh, I'm, I suppose I, I don't know if there's a question here, but maybe there's just a reflection. Um, I, I'm suddenly making the connection to that ever present sense of exhaustion that I feel just waking up and living. And I wonder at now uh, that's that's probably all this stuff, right? I mean, that's probably all this experience of just trying to keep up all the time and not feeling like I can ever afford a break, because if I afford a break, I could lose it all. I can relate. ADHD is a chronic, it's a chronic condition, right? Um, And we don't always think of it that way because it's just like, oh, this is what I wake up and deal with or not every day. And, but it truly is a chronic condition. And so I think you're also putting, uh, giving a voice to some of the frustration and the grief around having to deal with it. It's like, damn it, I don't want to deal with this today. Yeah. (laughs) I don't want to. Well, you know, um, well, there's something there's something to the mystery of like not knowing and not having these conversations sometimes because the ostrich ability in me is like, OK, well, I'd rather think of it as something else. So let's go ahead and not, not make those connections because I really could just use another bowl of cereal. <laughs> Who doesn't need a bowl of cereal? I mean, really? <laughs> uh, but what I was going to say, Pete, is that uh, that kind of also ties back into what we were talking about with Marilyn Paul last week is how important yeah. it is to have a day off and have yeah. rest and get away from the to-do list and get away from having that pressure of feeling I have to make up for something. You know, Nikki, that has been so hard for me to wrap my head around, right? This whole idea of creating the stop day where you don't have where you don't fall into the trap of checklisting your recreation right make sure i read book make sure i go hiking make sure i do this check 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 uh i i can't i i have yet to be able to internalize that guidance because again if i let my system down i've trained myself i have been trained through the blessing of experience that if I let down that guard at all, then I I 
it's extraordinarily difficult to rebuild. It's months to rebuild. I'm going to find- I'm going to call right? you out on that. <laughs> <laughs> because okay. you have, I, I don't think you're giving yourself enough credit because I think you have really solid systems and you trust those systems and you have worked hard on those systems that you don't have to start all over again. I think there's a little bit of black and white thinking there. Well, there probably is, but I'm, I'm also like, I uh, credit where it's due. Like I, to you noticing that i i think you're catching me also talking about this conversation having this experience on the same day that i'm still dealing with rebuilding from being in bed for a month right right yeah, yeah. like that was and and that was an extraordinary test of systems and i'm exhausted i'm so yeah. tired yeah i'm so tired of rebuilding and trying to get things organized again so i recognize that there's some mm -hmm. of that um uh, but it, and I don't. I well, you're surely doing don't great. need to make this conversation about me, <laughs> but I appreciate that. You're but. doing great. Well, I think it's important. I think you bring up something that I I hear a lot of, uh, and so I think it's important thing to give voice to, Pete, because I think it's a very common feeling and experience. Um, you know, my folks were in town. We went up to the mountains, and I don't know about you guys, but every time I do take this break, I'm, I need like the first day of the break. I'm just sort of like restless, aimless, anxious. I can't. I need, can't. And then like, you know, by it's time, but by the day it's time to leave, then I'm like really fully in right. the mode, yeah. but then it's time to leave. And then I leave feeling like I really didn't get much of a break. Right. Yeah. So it's like building in the space and building in the compassion and permission. Like I know it's going to take me mm -hmm. a week to get back to the systems. Like I'm kind of going to have a messy life for a week when I get back and that is okay. But these days I, and the other thing is there's something about like, it could even be an Airbnb down the block, but if I am not, it's like, I have to be in somebody else's mm -hmm. house at a hotel or in nature. If I am at my house doing nothing, it feels very different than if I'm at an Airbnb, it literally could be next door. I totally agree with doing you. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. hundred percent. It's these yeah. spaces in our he minds we have Absolutely. to create the, the separation. Yeah. yeah. I just, I just yeah. like to rifle through other people's stuff. Airbnb is perfect. <laughs> just is really centering. <laughs> these awesome. people live <laughs> yeah right i'm cooking in your pans now joe and marlene huh? <laughs> oh that's crazy uh, this is why i love this part. <laughs> Why? Oh my goodness. Well, this has been an exhausting roller coaster of an emotional experience for me. Thanks, Michelle. I feel like you say that every time. I know. Um, what are you doing? I, well, <laughs> I, I so I much know. appreciate you uh, being here, though, and talking about this because I know, you know, from our family standpoint, it was a very pivotal point in my daughter's life and in our family's life, right? And it is going to continue to be. Um, uh, a journey for sure. Um, one of the things that I really want to just stress to people out there, especially if you're a parent, is trust your instinct. You know, if you think something's not right, even if the doctor's telling you, no, everything's fine, or it's just a little bit of anxiety because, you know, she's a teenager. Mm, I don't know. Get a second opinion. Keep digging. Be an advocate for yourself, for them. And keep in mm -hmm. mind, you know, like I, yeah, even on these uh, rating scales, uh, you know, of ADHD symptoms, I mean, remember that 95 plus percent of the people who respond to them do not endorse these challenges, <laughs> like as certainly not all of them. And so if you are like, you don't have to convince yourself out of out of it, just go get it checked out. Just, you know, I think we check, we we sort of talk ourselves out of it. But the truth is, People don't come in for treatment and di diagnostic services at the rate that they should because of stigma. Um, there's a lot of underdiagnosis of a lot of a lot of mental health challenges. Uh, so to your point, you know, if if there's even a hint of a doubt, the 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 risks that come with not doing anything are a lot higher than going in and them saying, you know what, it seems okay right now. Come back in two years, or you're good. I mean. At least then you know, but the risk of not doing anything can be pretty dire. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. Well, thank you, thank you so oh, much. Yes, thank you so okay. much. But hey, where where are you? Uh, where do you want people to go learn more about you? What are you pitching right now? Do you write up? Do you write another book yet? No, you know, I've just been. 
I don't know. I don't know. It's still March in my mind. I don't know what I've been doing for months. You can find me at ADHD underscore doc at Instagram. Uh, you can email me Dr. Frank at enrichedcenter.org. Um, and you can look up our book, a uh, radical guide for women with ADHD on Amazon. You want, you want to know where my, the level of my pathos right now, I had a dream yeah. two nights ago and yeah. I was speaking at a conference to, sh to talk about my new book and it was called Look, I wrote a book during the pandemic, a, a <laughs> spiritual guide to not feeling shame for not doing as much as I did during the pandemic by Pete Wright. And it was a book about literally nothing. I had nothing to say about it, but I wrote a book during the pandemic and I needed everybody to know about that. <laughs> and it, I woke up feeling like I'd let a bazillion people down. Really? Yeah. I was just thinking that is the most brilliant, ironic presentation <laughs> session that could ever yes. be done. Yes. <laughs> It's like performance That's art. Right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Note to self. Michelle says, workshop the book during a pandemic thing. Thank you Blank so pages. much. Blank Blank pages. Pages. Just blank. Right. Can you get your publisher in on that? I think we have something to do. I'm going to need a contact. We sure appreciate you, Michelle, and we appreciate all of you for subscribing and downloading this show. Thank you for your time and your attention. On behalf of Michelle Frank and Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright. We'll be back next week on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast.